Gusta Casa Cabo, and welcome to a read aloud of Caciques and Semi Idols, the web spun by Taino Rulers between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico by Jose R. Oliver, part seven. In the last video, we stopped um, at chapter 17, so that's what we'll be picking up. And chapter 17 is the Guaisa face masks, gifts of the living for the living. If ancestor semis, such as skulls and calabashes and cotton idols, were the physical links between the living cacique and his relative ancestors, mutually defining their personhood, then the guaisa, or face, was the extension of the living cacique's soul to other living human beings. The Taino term guaisa was given by Fray Bartolomé de las Casas to refer to what the Spanish called caratona or caratula, that is a, quote, face mask, end quote in Castilian. Ahrom correctly shows that this term is cognate with the term wa isiba, or our face, used by modern Locono Arawak of Guiana. Ahrom suggests that the guaisa, quote, is what individualizes and distinguishes a person when alive, end quote. But it's more than just a word for face or masks, since Pané gave the word Goisa, the meaning of, quote, spirit or soul of the living, end quote. Quote, when the person is alive, they call his or her spirit Goisa, end quote. In other words, the face of a being is the portal to or repository of the soul or spirit of a living human being. I disagree with Ahrom only in his view of the human being as an indivisible, non-partable person and, consequently, that the carved face masks are likewise individual, detached, and indivisible entities. Instead, these guaisa masks are extensions or parts that compose the living person. These face masks can thus be thought of as a visual synthesis of the head or face of the living cacique spirit or soul that also contain that intangible potency and quality of having a living soul. If so, then they're quite distinct in concept from the skeletal sculptured stone heads or the skull heads of ancestors whose soul is of a different nature. It is opia, also transcribed as operito. A being is an operito, says Pane, when living humans cannot find a navel in the body. Operito means dead. The island Carib language includes the cognate term opeyim, meaning, quote, spirit of the dead, end quote. Spirits of the dead, however, can materialize as full-bodied persons, especially in the forest during nighttime, and their appearance is identical to a living human being except for the lack of a navel, the key anatomical part that connects the umbilical cord to the nurturing blood of the mother's placenta, and thus life. These same beings can also materialize in different body forms, guava-eating bats or owls. The absence of a belly button denotes that the potency that animates the being is of a different source in nature, the non-living spirit, the opia. Indeed, Pané's account makes the separation of living versus non-living quite clear. Any ordinary living human being attempting to sexually interact with or apprehend an opia being is doomed to failure as the opia always escapes. This interaction is barren and does not result in human reproduction or pregnancy. These potential encounters with opia agency beings, or dead souls, are presented in myth as sexually alluring, yet dangerous and unproductive. This is one reason the natives avoid going out into the forest during the night. This discretion is important to the discussion of guaisa in that it alerts us to the fact that both the opia and guaisa animate beings that can assume different bodies or parts of bodies that have physical presence in the world. Of course, the opi is a potency that animates the departed former or non-living humans. Guaisa is the power animating the still living humans. It is clear from Pane's account about native religious beliefs of death and that the dead spirit beings activate at dusk and night when the sun sets under the western horizon. By contrast, the proper yet ordinary time for living human activity is during daylight from sunrise to sunset. The association of absence of light or night light with the activation of the numinous is one reason for placing the semi-idols in the darkest recesses inside the cane or a cave.
and why the cojoba ceremonies generally took place at dusk or night and in dark enclosed space, uh, places, not spaces. The guaisa is not simply an artifact that measures artisans' skill with a value translatable in just economic terms, such as quality of material plus labor investment equaling value. Rather, it is an item that captivates and contains something valuable by virtue of its relation to its prototype, the cacique's living soul, which native believers locate in the face of a person. This value is not just in labor input and material output, but much more on who is the living soul expressed or contained in this face mask. What a cacique is giving with a guaisa is a potent part of his personhood, his living soul. In contrast to the stone heads, for which there is not a single recorded instance of being used for exchange or trade, the guaisas are time and time again the favored high-value gifts to be given precisely to foreign caciques, including stranger ones like Christopher Columbus, who the Taino regarded as Guamiquina or Guamaiquina, a title meaning, quote, our principal or first lord, end quote. As Moscoso pointed out, these guaisa objects were the most ubiquitous of all gifts given by caciques of Hispaniola. They figured prominently in the exchanges between Guacanagari and Coanabo with Christopher Columbus. Even before Columbus disembarked on the domain of Marien, where Guacana, Guacanari's settlement was located near today's in Basaline, Haiti, the cacique, quote, sent him, Columbus, through a servant and ambassador, a sash or belt, that instead of having a pouch, it had a caratula or face mask that had two large ears of hammered gold and also the tongue and eyes. This belt was made of very tiny beads made of white fish bones or, you know, shell in, intercalated with red ones as done in needlepoint. Next day, on December 23rd, 1492, Columbus sent six of his men to reciprocate. Guacanagari received the party, took them to his house, and ordered meals to be served. All the while, the natives kept bringing the Spaniards, quote, many items of cotton woven and spun in bales, end quote, while the cacique offered them three fat ducks and gold nuggets. Afterward, the Spaniards returned to their ships accompanied by natives in their canoes. Throughout all, quote, the day came more than 120 canoes to the Spanish ships, all loaded with people. All had something to exchange with the Christians, bread and fish, food, water in jars made of clay that were very well made and painted outside with iron oxide, which is red, and some seeds as spices, end quote, namely ahi. Two of the most coveted Spanish items were the bronze or tin, laton bells, and Mozarabic glass beads. After these initial and successful exchanges, Columbus resolved to meet Guacanagari at his settlement in Marien, which is very likely the archaeological site known today as En Basaline. At midnight on December 25th, the Santa Maria floundered on a coral reef or a sandbank. It was thanks to Guacanagari's command that the cargo and sailors of the Santa Maria were safely rescued and brought to his settlement. Las Casas, in agreement with Columbus, noted that these caciques, quote, as judges or lords of the señorios, are all obeyed that is marvelous to see. And all these lords are of few words and elegant customs, and their command is, at most, given by making hand gestures, which are then understood, end quote, by all. It is in this context that on December 26, Guacanagari met Columbus on the ship La Pinta to reassure him that all the materials rescued from Santa Maria, from the Santa Maria, were safe and to offer further assistance. In the meantime, canoes with natives from other settlements were also engaged in active trading, especially of gold nuggets, quote, wrapped in cotton cloth, end quote, for the coveted cast tin bells and glass beads. Guacanagari, I can talk. Guacanagari and the native traders told the Spaniards that the gold nuggets were coming from the rivers draining the Cibao mountain range and farther east. That mountain range, by the way, would be Cacique Guanabo's uh, Maguana region. After having a meal in La Pinta, Guacanagari invited the admiral to his settlement. Quote, they made him, Columbus, a great reception and honor, and he... Guacanagari 
took him to his house and he ordered drinks consisting of a mixture of three kinds of fruits and fish and game and other viandas, which is a mix of stewed tubers that they had and also bread called cassavi or cassava to be served to the guests. He took him, Columbus, to see the very pretty verduras or greenery and tree gardens next to the houses. And the king, Guacanagari, already wore a shirt and gloves that the admiral had given him. And what was most celebrated and feasted were the gloves. After dining, which took a long while, they brought him, Columbus, many herbs, with which he refreshed his hands. And then they both rinsed their hands with water. After the dinner, he took the admiral to the beach, and then the admiral sent for a Turkish bow and a bunch of arrows that he brought from Castile and had a man from his company shoot them. And the king, as he did not know that these were weapons because they did not have them or use them, thought it was a great thing. All of this, the admiral said, Las Casas inserted comment, then they brought to the admiral a grain caratula that had large pieces of gold in the ears and eyes and in other parts, which he gave along with other gold jewels. And the king himself put it on the admiral's head and neck and to the other Christians that were with him, Columbus, he gave many of gold, many things of gold, end quote. This passage narrated the first time ever that a native chief from Hispaniola engaged in full-scale diplomatic relations with the Spanish, and as such, the protocols of Guacanagari followed had to be based on past experience, following strictly pre-Hispanic notions of reciprocity and exchange. As will be discussed later, Guacanagari had an agent had an agenda behind such diplomacy. He was seeking to forge an alliance with Columbus to gain advantage over Guano. Guanabo and Bejequio, two neighboring paramount caciques who he claimed had stolen or killed his women. Columbus needed Guacanagari's support if he was to leave his 39 men at La Navidad and for them to explore the gold-bearing sources while he sailed back to Spain to organize a second, better stocked expedition. He was, of course, aware that to explore the, quote, eastern, end quote, gold sources in Cibao, the mythical Matinino Island and beyond, notwithstanding Columbus's confusion of mythical with natural geography, he would need a dependable infrastructural he would need a dependable infrastructural support and supply, especially of food, for his thirty nine men and all the help he could get from Guacanagari upon his return from Spain. But before the Admiral's departure on december thirtieth, fourteen ninety two, a day after the exchange described above, a final round of gift exchanges and diplomacy took place. This time, not only Guacanagari was present, but also five other, quote, kings, end quote, who Las Casas described as, quote, his subjects, end quote. The following passage reads, The admiral left to eat on land and arrived at the same time that five kings, all subjects of his great lord Guacanagari, had arrived, all wore their crowns of gold on their heads, representing great authority, to such a degree that the admiral said to the kings of Castile and Aragon, quote, your highnesses would have most pleasure to see their ways. It is to be believed that the King Wakanagari sent for them to come to better display his greatness, end quote. And upon landing, the king came to receive him and took him by the arm to the same house of yesterday where there was the tribune or platform. And the seats in one of which he, Wakanagari, had the admiral seat with great courtesy and respect. Then he took his gold crown from his head and placed it on the admiral's. The admiral took from his neck a necklace of good alaqueques or cornaline beads and a beautifully covered beads that looked all around very well and put it on him or guacanagari. And then he, Columbus, gave him a cap of fine silk he was wearing that day and placed it on him, guacanagari. And he sent also for a pair of colored borseguies a type of shoe, and had him wear them. In addition, he, Columbus, put on his Guacanagari's finger a large ring made of silver. With these jewels, the king found himself very rich and remained the happiest man in the world. So it's clear that the caratulas noted by the Spanish were items that formed a kind of buckle to hold a sash made of beads and cotton worn around the belt or hung as pendants from a stone necklace. However, some of these guaisas seem to also have been worn like diadems attached to a headgear or cotton band sewn together with multicolored beads and decorated with maca papagayo feathers. 
I suspect that not all guaisas necessarily depicted an anthropomorphic face, but most archaeological sam samples have human-like faces. Aside from the interesting details of the native Spanish protocols of diplomacy and reciprocity, the key point is that the Guayisa of Guacanagari was only gifted to what he correctly perceived to be the cacique of the Spaniards, Christopher Columbus. No other Spanish subordinate or emissary sent by Columbus was recipient of such a gift. For them, the other items were given and exchanged. This pattern is repeated between Columbus and Macorish-speaking cacique Mayobanesh, who resided in the northeastern territory marked as Hiabo, also, Hayabo or Hujabo in the 1516 map of Morales. This is an example of the cacique giving his individual face or soul. This also means that his or her personhood was being distributed and extended to others. The Admiral left Marien and La Navidad sailing eastward along the north coast to ultimately go back to Spain, but he succumbed to the pressure to discover where the place or gold deposits were, and thus along the way he explored and stopped at various points on the northern and eastern coasts. He reached an area inhabited by the so-called Siguayo Indians on what is today the eastern tip of Samana Peninsula. Like the Macorish Indians found on the northeastern coast, the Siguayos wore long hair, quote, like women in Castile, end quote, gathered with nets and macaw feathers. The word Siguayo refers not to an ethnic group as such, but to his hairstyle, but to this hairstyle, rather. Neither the Macorishes nor Siguayos' native language was Taino. Upon landing on the beach, the Spanish were confronted by some 55 natives with long bows and arrows, with whom they had a skirmish that resulted in the death of many. It was the first killing of natives in the New World, which Columbus commemorated by naming it the Golfo de la Flecha, or Gulf of Arrows. After news of the incident reached out, reached one unnamed Siguayo chief or cacique who lived far from the site, the cacique sent on January 14, 1493, an envoy to Columbus, apparently in order to offer peace, but also, I suspect, to appraise the admirable's the admiral's forces, and to entice him to negotiate some kind of agreement that both could live by. Hence, the envoy of the unnamed cacique told the admirable, admirable, admiral, ah, let me start over. Hence, the envoy of the unnamed cacique told the admiral that the next morning his chief would send the caratula of gold and wisely let the admiral know that there was lots of gold in other islands to the east, for example, the mythical Matinino and other real islands like Boriqueng. As Halid Suez Badillo and others have noted, not only the Siguayo chief, but ever since asking about gold in Cuba, the natives too try to get rid of Columbus by sending him to the next region uh, to the east, even his staunch ally, Guacanagari. In the event, in, in the event, the next morning, the admiral and his men disembarked only to find out that the, quote, king, end quote, did not show up because his, quote, village was far away, end quote but had nevertheless sent an emissary with a, quote, crown of gold as promised, end quote, while the other natives came with gifts of, quote, cotton, bread, ajes, or sweet potatoes, um, ipomea batatas, and other edibles to eat, albeit all were armed with their bows and arrows, end quote, that were, quote, as tall as those from England, end quote. The Siguayo chief either had second thoughts, hoping that the gifts of appeasement would suffice, or in fact he genuinely lived too far away to make the trip. The Spaniards, meanwhile, exchanged the usual trinkets for gold and other items. Back on the ship, a canoe with four young natives arrived, possibly wishing to continue trading with the Spaniards. However, lamentably, Columbus decided to capture and take them to Castile against their will because, argued Las Casas, of their valuable information on gold sources on other islands to the east. This was also the first act of enslavement of Amerindians. I suspect also that these Indians would be the hard evidence Columbus needed to convince the Spanish monarchs of the untold gold riches yet to be found, ensuring both the admiral's contract, his vice royalty, and the economic support he needed for the return voyage. On his second voyage, the admiral returned to the Bay of La Navidad on November 27, 1493. As is well known, the 39 Spaniards left at La Navidad had been killed, a few by disease, others by fighting among themselves over native women, and still others had left La Navidad inland with their native mistresses to Maguana, the land of Cacique Coanabo, quote, who killed all 10 or 12 of them, end quote. 
And many days later, Juan Abo came with a large army and raided the La Navidad fortress and the houses. The seven Spaniards still in La Navidad had fled toward the sea where they supposedly drowned. Guacanagari confirmed the accounts given by the Indians to Columbus, and indeed, he was still in the house nursing battle injuries. The previous night, Guacanagari had sent two envoys to Columbus's ship with magnificent, quote, caratulas that they called guaicas or guaisas, very well made and with some gold, presenting them on behalf of King Guacanagari, end quote. It ought not to be forgotten that Guacanagari had an old score to settle against Guanabo for having kidnapped or killed two of his women. Therefore, the reason for the battle that doomed La Navidad is a complicated triangle starting with the old enmity between Guacanagari and Guanabo, to which the Spaniards added fuel and the excuse of Guanabo to kill two birds with one stone. As Leslie Bird Simpson noted, quote, these men who went to Española in the first 10 years were the choicest collection of riffraff ever brought together, ex-soldiers, broken noblemen, adventurers, criminals, and convicts. That there were some high-minded men among them does not appreciably alter the general picture, end quote. Francisco Moscoso discussed several other contexts in which cotton-made guaisas sewn in stone, known as sivas, or shell-beaded garments and decorated gold sheets were gifted to Admiral Columbus. These appear in the famous treasure list, with some items revealing that these were taken from, from Guanabo's brothers from the Maguana chiefdom after their defeat in the 1495-1496 to 1496 battles. In addition to the key points that the caratulas or guaisas were only gifted from caciques to the highest ranked Spanish or native cacique, there's the importance there's the important detail of how often the same type of item was gifted to the same person. Not one, but at least three instances were recorded in which Guacanagari gave Columbus his guaisas, and one occasion where it's clear that more than one guaisa, guaisa were offered in the same transaction. Inevitably, this implies that a cacique had many such guaisas at his disposal, especially when compared to other different kinds of semi-idols. It seems responsible to propose that, unlike semi-icons, these face masks were not manufactured as a result of an uncanny encounter with semi, as spirit, manifestations in nature. These items may or may not be imbued with semi, but they do seem to have potency since, after all, they are the guaisa, the living soul, of their cacique owners. In turn, the living soul of the cacique, what gives him his power and agency, is concentrated in the face. I think it's likely that the guaisa in the mask and in the human cacique are shared and extended parts of individual entities. The guaisa is an extension of a part of the cacique, the very core of his personhood, his soul. And also the guaisa, having the cacique's living soul, will retain that part of the cacique wherever the, gua the, the guaisa goes. Although impossible to prove, it could well be that this condition of animacy, having a soul, of having potential and actual agency is also encompassed by the notion of semi. In contrast to the ancestor semi stoneheads, the guaisas do not seem to have been the subject of any cult or veneration, nor were they ever consulted or used in divination by a cojoba ceremonies. Rather, they seem to personify the political political religious potency and power of their original holder. Hence, the gift is one that is geared toward the public display of the greatness of the cacique, and hence, it has value for the receiver. We'll go back up and look at that uh, table in a minute, but to put it tritely, the donor's aura and prestige rub off onto the receiver. It is striking that while Guacanagari gave the Guaisas to cement and reinforce an advantageous alliance with Columbus to hedge against his rifle caciques Coanabo and Bejequio, others like the Siguayo cacique in Samana had used them for quite the opposite, as a means to get rid of Columbus and his men, although perhaps he also sought some form of alliance or appeasement, knowing the terrible consequences of a renewed armed conflict, or the killing at Golfo de las Flechas, with the Spanish. As the saying goes, if you can't beat them, you better join them, and if at all possible, with some advantages coming your way. So going back up to the table that I scrolled past, um, table two, is a selection of Columbus's treasure list. It lists the region, the cacique of that region, how many guaisas, how many cotton, how many stone sivas, and how many gold or caona 
quote unquote treasures were um, were listed. So the first row is Maguana Hispaniola, which is Coanabo's brothers. Um, there were 11 guaisas, 11 cotton, 11 stone sivas, and one gold canoa. Then the next row in the same that in the same order is three 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 seven. The following row shows only two guaisas and and none for all the rest of the items. The row below that was two guaisas and only ten gold caona with no cotton or stone sivas. The row below that one guaisa, no cotton, no stone sivas, four gold or caona. One guaisa for the following row, nothing else but seven gold caona. The next region would be, is listed as Hispaniola, and it says unknown cacique donors. For the guaisas, there were five, no cotton, no stone, eight pieces of gold. Um, then the row below that is one guaisa. Let me go back up so I can make sure I say the appropriate columns. One guaisa. No cotton, no stone, three gold. The next row is three guaisas, no cotton, no stone, 11 gold. The row below that, one guaisa, no cotton, no stone, 10 gold. Then five guaisa, no cotton, no stone, 15 gold. Then one guaisa, one cotton, no stone, nine gold. Following that, four guaisas, no cotton, no stone, 21 gold. And lastly, two guaisas, no cotton, no stone, and nine gold. So in total, we have 42 guaisas, 15 cotton, 14 stone or sivas, and 115 gold or canoa. And below is an asterisk that says, quote, account of gold jewels and other things that the admiral obtained after the receiver, Sebastián de Olaño, left the island for Castillon the year 95, end quote and 95 being 1495. And the following information says, Archivo General de Indias, Patronato Legajo, Ocho Ramo Doce, Colección de Documentos Inéditos, Pacheco et al, Primera Serie, Tomo 10, Página 5 a 9, Reproduced from Oliver. Now back to the reading. Also, unlike the sculptor, sculptured stone heads or skull semi-idols, guaisas were highly visible gifts in alliance formations among foreign and even stranger caciques, as Columbus was in their eyes, and were given more than once between the parties, as Guacanari demonstrated. This repetition had to be a traditional pre-Columbian practice of reciprocal exchange of guaisas. Columbus, of course, repaid in kind with other items, but I would expect that Guacanagari's gifts of guaisas to native allied and foreign caciques would, on occasion, be repaid with similar guaisa icons. If so, this could have very interesting consequences. Many allied caciques would have often displayed in their regalia someone else's face mask or soul as their own. And this means that a good number of guaisa artifacts found at any given archaeological site are not likely to be locally made. While, of course, it was part of the symbolic and actual wealth of the local chief, the Guaisas, under his control, would still retain such value and esteem by virtue of the relationship to their original cacique. I wonder what would happen to a Guaisa given by a cacique who later would, for whatever reasons, kidnap his woman, as was, um, kidnap his women, rather, as was the Guacanari Guanabo case. Would it be ritually destroyed, traded away, or buried in a midden? Clearly, guaisas cannot be comfortably classed as either alienable or inalienable possessions. On the one hand, they're inalienable in that a spiritual essence of the guaisa face, the living soul, is attached to and defined by the living cacique. On the other hand, they are gifted. I suspect that no matter who controlled the item after being gifted, it always retained that attachment to its original source, and that this likely is one of the reasons such items were valued, perhaps even more, by foreigner or stranger chiefs, not the least because of their exotic aura. On the other hand, these are evidently and eminently alienable things, as the above cases imply, illustrate. In practice, though, they are neither alienable nor inalienable simply because of the very notion of individuality and partability of persons or things. 
The object does not have to be physically kept because, in fact, its essence, the living soul of the cacique, was never subtracted from or lost by him when giving the, guasi, the guaisa. This would not entail the dissipation or loss of part of the political religious power held by the donor cacique. One key conclusion can be made between guaisas and stoneheads. The stoneheads are all about ancestors, genealogical ties, history, and hence memories. The emphasis is on vertical or deep time relations involving relatives. By contrast, the guaisas are all about horizontal relations, about the here and now or shallow time relations with non-kin, with potential partners and allies. Guaisas are gifts for the living. Stoneheads are gifts from the dead. Given how prominent an exchange item the guaisa was and that it was uniquely singled out as the item to be gifted to stranger and foreign caciques, it's not surprising that guaisas have a far wider geographic distribution than the stone heads, though not the skulls and baskets, elbow stones and stone collars. Guaisas have been found from central eastern Cuba as far south as the Grenadines. And that only takes into account those guaisas made of resistant materials, especially shell. Those made of cotton or wood only have not been preserved. So chapter 18, the circulation of chiefs' names, women, and semis between the greater and lesser Antilles. One of the motivations for the circulation of semi-idols and other valuables, including guaisas, was to strengthen and reaffirm political economic support among caciques in the greater Antilles. Funerary feasts of deceased caciques provided one context in which semi-idols cycled from generation to generation and from chiefdom to chiefdom. Establishing political alliances also involved other parallel or contemporary complementary exchanges, of which three others, besides semi-idols, are important. First is the gift of guaisas. Second is the exchange of women as brides. The last one involved packs cemented through the exchange of names, or guatiao, and where women could also, but not always, be exchanged. The four together, semi-idols, guaisas, chief names, and brides, form complementary exchange systems in a network of chiefly alliances. As Jalín Suet Bahillo has aptly discussed, caciques in Hispaniola and Puerto Rico, at least at the time of the initial Spanish contact, were the only members of society identified by the Spanish chroniclers to be polygamous. Besides being a status marker, polygamy indeed was a useful political tool to extract and extend political alliances with neighboring foreign as well as subordinated caciques. Fejequio, who in 1492 was arguably the most powerful cacique of Hispaniola, leading the Bainoa or Jaragua chiefdom, had 30 wives. He was already mentioned in connection with his funeral involving the sacrificial internment of two of his wives. His rival and competitor, Cacique Guacanagari, ruler of the much smaller chiefdom around Marien, at one time had 20 wives. Such polygamous households must have been potent units of social and economic production. Among other things, the chief's household commanded large areas of agricultural production that generated staple wealth, which is the one thing the Spanish relied upon to literally feed the conquerors and hence supported the whole colonial enterprise in the Greater Antilles. Another mechanism to extend the network of political and social relations among caciques was through the ceremony of Guatiao, which, as noted earlier, includes the ritualized exchange of names between two parties. Suet Badillo defined it as a, quote, pact of eternal friendship between the caciques and those visitors that the caciques considered their equals, end quote. Caciques also did more than decide on their own marriages. In extending their, spheres of, in extending their sphere of political alliances, the cacique also determined who their female kindred, like sisters, nieces, and daughters, should marry. As Suet Barillo noted, it is not known with total certainty whether Guatiao automatically entailed marital, exchange, marital exchanges, but I concur with him that there are strong indications that such exchanges were implemented, albeit probably not on every occasion. Guatiao was no doubt an effective mechanism for widening the kinship network, quote, when co-sanguity did not offer enough resources to meet the demands of production, end quote, of the extended chiefly household or activated when, quote, political commitment or commitments of other kinds, end quote, required it. A Guatiao pact, along with the offering of one of the cacique's female kin, was precisely what cacique Agüevana I did with Juan Ponce de Leon, 
who he identified as his equal in rank and status when he set foot in Borinquen, as we shall see later. If bridal exchanges were a means to extend political influence and alliances, these women were also the targets of political competition and a source for, or symptom of, political tension that could lead to rupture and to war. According to Soed Barillo, Casigazos held units of various social types in vassalage under them with ideological effects that were terribly confusing to the Spaniards. Intergroup discrimination, such as that which occurred in the province of Guacayarima, or with the Macorises or Macorish, the Siguayos and Lucayos, the Lucayos being natives of the Bahamas, etc., were simply a reflection of the forced coexistence of groups that had historically been autonomous. It's possible that institutionalized violence represented in wars or the raids carried out by caciques in order to kidnap women or steal other caciques semi-idols was res resorted to in pursuance of these distinctions. Indeed, Suet Badillo cites... The well-known example of kidnapping or killing women reported by Las Casas, Hernando Colón, and others in Hispaniola. The enmity and rivalry that existed between Guacanagari, chief of the Marien chiefdom, and both Coanabo of the Maguana chiefdom and Bejequio of the Jaragua or Bainoa chiefdom came about because, quote, the other caciques were against him, Guacanagari, particularly Bejequio, because he had killed one of his wives and Coanabo who stole the other one. This is the reason why he begged Christopher Columbus to help him get her back and avenge him for these injuries, end quote. It is the circumstance that led Cacique Guaracanagari to seek a politically advantageous alliance with Christopher Columbus when he first reached this region and established the short-lived settlement of La Navidad near in, in Basaline in Haiti. Kidnapping or stealing women, like stealing semi-idols, surely signals competition between caciques, perhaps even factional rivalries among subordinated caciques within the chiefdom. And of course, kidnapping and theft as a last resort, as a last recourse, could and probably often did result in open armed conflict between rival chiefs and chiefdoms. Such situations were thoroughly exploited by the Spanish, pitting chief against chief and changing the equation of native allegiances. It's likely that the theft of women, like that of semi-idols, was not a new tactic that developed solely in response to the Spanish, but a practice that almost certainly had been deployed in pre-Columbian times. In any case, the kidnapping of women, like that of semi-idols, took place in an environment of stress and pending, if not effective, political crisis. The guaisas made of stone or shell have survived, but those made of perishable materials have not and are only known thanks to their description in ethno-historic documents. The stone guaisas are characteristic of Puerto Rico, whereas those made of shell are much less frequent, yet prevalent in Hispaniola and eastern Cuba. Some of the stone guaisa masks of Puerto Rico were clearly not made to be strung in a necklace or strapped in an armband as they lack perforations. Instead, I think the guaisas were probably for hand presentation and display. They could have also been wrapped in cloth, as the natives usually did with nuggets of gold when bartering with the Spanish in colonial times. But other guaisas, possibly of shell or cotton, were worn as pectorals, as clearly depicted in the petroglyph Semi of Caguana in Puerto Rico. By way of contrast, in Hispaniola and eastern Cuba, shell guaisas predominate and thus were meant to be strung in necklaces or pectoral plaques or sewn into belts, headbands, and armbands, as is clearly depicted in an anthropomorphic pendant from the Dominican Republic. The shell-made guaisas have, thus far, the widest geographical distribution, reaching as far south into the lesser Antilles as Il de Ronde, or La Redonda, in the Grenadines. As discussed in the previous section, in Hispaniola Guaisas were the gifts par excellent offered to stranger caciques and leaders, that is, to prominent individuals well outside the polity controlled or ruled by a cacique. The water geographic distribution of all non-perishable Guaisas, especially shell, makes sense given their primary function as symbolic gifts to foreign leaders. The Guaisa gifts would probably be accompanied with name or bride exchanges if the circumstances merited further strengthening the pact of the alliance. Before addressing the implications of the gift of the Guaisa, a few words about the surviving Guaisa artifacts are necessary. Regardless of whether the Guaisa was made of stone, shell, or cotton, or how it was worn or displayed, it's a part that identifies and forms the person of the cacique. To give it to others is to offer the receiving caciques the living soul that is represented by this object. 
Being a vital part that constitutes the cacique's personhood, his living soul, meant that giving guaisas was a mean of extending a part of the cacique's person to the other receiving person, a potential political ally or trade partner. The extension of the person of the cacique or leader via the guaisa is reminiscent of the heroic of the heroic quote divine kings end quote of Polynesia discussed by Marshall Thalens. These are lords, quote, whose heroic capacities and actions summarize, unify, encompass, and thus expansively internalize the relations of a society's members as a whole. Such figures are social historical individuals, end quote. Salin's view, as paraphrased by Moskal, is that, quote, persons of this magnitude personify their respective societies almost literally, that is, as heroic, so, as, as heroic societies. Salen said of the Polynesian chief that he lives the life of a whole tribe, stands in a certain relation to neighboring tribes and kinship groups, and gathers the relationship to other tribes in his person, end quote. In this Polynesian model of heroic chiefs, their persons are built up to expansively encompass, internalize, and subsume all the relations of society in his persona. But in the case of the caciques in Hispaniola in Puerto Rico, to do so requires giving a part of their personhood, the guaisa, or living soul materializes an object, to other leaders and allies so that they can be encompassing. Guaisas were unlike the three-pointed or ancestor stone heads examined earlier in that they appear not to be the subject of veneration and consultation in cojoba ceremonies, but instead appear to be an essential component of the cacique's political religious prowess and thus of his personhood. To use Walker's terms, the Guaisa was personally, quote, owned, end quote, but performed a very public function. It was displayed as part of the attire that signals his or her place, status, and rank in society. Interestingly, repeatedly giving Guaisas also meant that any single cacique would have several other Guaisas available, indicating even further partability of his personhood. This form of distributed personhood parallels the Guaitiao ceremony when names between the leaders were exchanged with not one but as many allies as was necessary. In parallel, the cacique would also give and take in marriage as many women as it would be wise to exchange. It's probable that each guaisa, like the other semi-idols discussed, bore the names, titles, and genealogy of its source, the living cacique. I wonder what happened to the guaisas after the death of the cacique. And I mean both those he kept of his face or soul and those that were gifted to him by others being someone else's soul. Here, the archaeology is not very helpful, as most reports lack clear context. I know of no guaisas found in burial contexts, so again, these were apparently maintained in circulation. However, in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Hispaniola, a few shell guaisas have been found in what seem to be midden deposits. Perhaps they lost potency once their current owners passed away, or maybe what we think of as, quote, spent, end quote, items for garbage disposal were not so. A guaisa's disposal in a given midden may well respond to a ritual commemorative event, assuming that the guaisa never lost its potency. Probably there were regional variations as to what to do with guaisas after the death of a cacique, depending on factors such as whether the guaisa was his semblance or soul, or that of someone else being the giver of the guaisa. The fact is, we do not know with any degree of confidence Another problem is that an adequate, uh, blah, blah, blah. let me start over. <laughs> Another problem is that an adequate census of existing guaisas in the Caribbean needs to be carried out more fully. To date, only a very partial list totaling 54 specimens from the entire Caribbean has been, Caribbean has been compiled. The differential distribution of, set of shell versus stone guaisas is interesting. The prevalence of stone guaisas in Puerto Rico may indicate that as gifts to strangers, these largely circulated among chiefs throughout Puerto Rico. However, the shell guaisas are spread wide throughout the Caribbean, but are rare in Puerto Rico. Still, they are at least present in Puerto Rico, thus opening the possibility that some may have been circulated as gifts among chiefs in Hispaniola and elsewhere. First, let us look at the nexus between Hispaniola and Eastern Cuba. Section A, the nexus between Eastern Cuba and Hispaniola. The interconnectedness between Eastern Cuba and Hispaniola is strongly indicated not only by the presence of shell guaisas in both islands, but also by their strong similarities in ceramic styles and the presence of a range of sculptural art or semi-icons that suggests a strong participation in what I've been calling dainones. 
Las Casas reported that some 50 years before the Spanish conquest of Hispaniola, natives from Hispaniola had migrated to Cuba. According to Cuban archaeologists, the interaction between Easter Cuban and Hispaniolan societies probably began as early as AD 800 and continued until the early years of Spanish conquest. These archaeologists recognized cultural variants or a spectrum of Taino or Taino in complexes such as Pueblo Viejo, Bani, Maisi, Bayamo, and Damahayabo. Dama, yeah, Damahayabo. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Anyway, other indigenous sites extended well into the Spanish colonial period, some apparently in relative isolation or marginated from European contacts, such as Los Buchillones, which others already display among, while others already display strong elements of syncretism and transculturation. For example, Chorro de Maita, Barajagua, La Vieja, El Yayal, and El Convento. The Los Buchillones site, located in Ciego del Avila on north central Cuba, extended its occupation into the 17th century or AD 1295 to 1655 and retained in its material culture all of its aboriginal, i.e., Taino, in heritage. The necropolis at Chorro de Maita, which was AD 800 or 900 to 1550, Located further east in the region of Banes, eastern Cuba, also retained an indigenous heritage into the middle of the 16th century, but European materials, including a Spanish skull, internment, and metals, were found in relative abundance. Although the ceramic styles for these Tainoan cultural variants relate to what Rouse called the Mejacan osteonoid, or to the Chican osteonoid series, the materials that can be regarded as ceremonial paraphernalia show strong parallels with those of Hispaniola and even Puerto Rico. There are, of course, both similarities as well as differences in these materials. For example, Cuban wood dujos are of the same type as those in Hispaniola and the Bahamas, with raised backs for reclining, or as those in Puerto Rico, which are flat benches. At sites like Los Buchillones, where wood has been preserved in astonishing abundance, miniature dujos were also found. While there are a number of wooden idols carved in the Chican osteonoid style, they do seem to be local rather than imports from Hispaniola or beyond. As in Puerto Rico, there are no wood icons but the round platform to hold the cojoa hallucinogen. Most prevalent in eastern Cuba are the small portable semi-icons made from various raw materials that are worn as body decorations or sewn into other objects. In the Banes Mañabón hill region, we find icons already familiar to us, a miniature three-pointed semi, a pendant with the crouched personage, a fragment of a vomiting spatula, and the head portion of a medium-sized three-pointer, which only has close analogs in Puerto Rico, just to mention a few. The shell guayistas from eastern Cuba also show strong stylistic affinities to the Hispaniolan sample. Given that guayisas were part of a system of gifts among stranger caciques, it's possible that some of the Cuban guayisas were manufactured in Hispaniola and vice versa. Shell, unfortunately, is a material that cannot be chemically analyzed or, quote, fingerprinted, end quote, to gain information about provenience. One of the interesting observations made by Las Casas about Cuba, based on memories of when he lived there in 1511 to 1514, is the presence of societies that he called Sibone, no doubt a term that hides considerable variation. Nevertheless, in comparison to what he had experienced in Hispaniola and what he identified in Cuban as recent arrivals from Hispaniola, the Sibone appeared to him simpler in their way of life and their material culture, and perhaps because their socio-political organization tended to show a more egalitarian ethos. He understood these, quote, original and, quote, Indo-Cuban inhabitants to be subservient, though not slaves, to those natives he thought of as originating from Hispaniola. It's unclear the degree to which the Siboneyes and the Taino and Hispaniolans, who had been migrating to Cuba from much earlier, had culturally amalgamated with locals. Given Las Casas' comments, one might suspect that key differences remain despite coexisting as a plural yet well-articulated society. Thus, in eastern Cuba, the religious ideology anchored in semiism is material well, materially well represented in the Sibone Taino bricolage. Such a phenomenon is not unheard of in ethnography as, for example, the case of the Tucano of 
Pira Parana Valpes in northwestern Amazonia. There, the Macu hunter gatherers are incorporated to the agrarian Tucan. Tucanoan society in the ceremonial or specialist role of, quote, servants, end quotes, while Tucano Sib members are assigned to the roles of chiefs, warriors, dancers, or chanters, and shamans. The later specialists' ceremonial roles are fulfilled by closely related agnates of a Sib for each simple or compound residential group that inhabits a maloca or longhouse. The Maku, despite their different ethno-linguistic origins, are thus articulated with the Tucano, who, in addition to Tucanoan, are Arawakan speakers, used mainly in ritual or domestic contexts. This and other similar social mechanisms of articulation have been noted by scholars to also characterize many of the Arawakan-speaking societies, and indeed, it's a key trait of, quote, Arawakanness, end quote. It's that capacity to include otherness, that is in part accountable for the huge geographical spread of the Arawakan stock of language, languages and the broad spectrum of cultural features displayed by these societies. Shell guaisas present on both islands are good indicators of the importance of gift exchanges among leaders and chiefs in creating forms of both sociopolitical and personal articulation within and between Eastern Cuba and Hispaniola following Salin's argument about heroic kings and of how they gather or subsume in their person what is in effect a plurality of social relations and ideologies like tribal lore, legends, rituals, icons, I'm tempted to think that the articulation of the quote, Sibone Taino, end quote, bricolage is in part facilitated and mediated through the gifts of Guaisas by the binding effect that giving his or her living soul to strangers or to others has. So um, I'm pretty sure that we're close to, if not just past the one hour mark. So we're going to go ahead and stop here at section B and pick up where we left off in the next video.